the last one. Better to okay. actually build wealth than to try to talk about what you've been doing to build wealth. So how can you stay consistent? What's something that you can do to make sure that you stay on the right tr on the right path and on the right track? We got to listen to the fourth thing we wish that we would realize earlier is that money does not watch the news. Yeah, it's so important because everything I said about that inevitable wealth, the inevitable wealth building journey is most of us. Okay. Did you know that, Lace? What? Money doesn't watch money the news. Money doesn't watch the news. Well, the first thing I'm thinking in my mind is, okay, I don't watch the news a lot. I'm mm. just going to say that, to be honest. But I, I do like keeping up with news, although they would tell me they would probably not like me having individual stocks, but I do own individual stocks and sure. I want to know what's happening in the world so that I can understand if I think that it is impacting my investments in some way or not. Right. I mean, I, it's a, it's because a, literally the money isn't watching the news, but I kind of feel like I am. It's a weird statement. They're going to go into like, well, there's a behavioral thing where it's like, okay, if you're watching the news and the news says this or that, and then you panic and you sell early or you start trading too much. I mean, it kind of dovetails with, you know, the lazy investing. Don't, don't try and play the market kind of thing, which, which is, is a fair statement to make. The problem is, is it's just a weird statement because there is a degree where if you're, um, a financial manager, a financial advisor, you need to be kind of aware, right? Um, and here's why, and here's why it's, it's good for individuals to be aware of the news is let's say, I'll give you a great example here. Um, I live uh, in Oregon and I used to run a lot of accounts for retirees who were civil servants and they have a pension through the state. And so I used to pay attention to the news about the pension all the time. I used to check it once a month, right? And then when they changed it, I had to have a bunch of people retire right away. Otherwise they'd have lost 15% of their pay every month. They'd have been leaving money on the table. But if I hadn't been paying attention to that and jumped on it and gotten them to retire before the deadline, they'd have been in big trouble, right? So there's an example of that. The other example is, is when you're talking about, okay, if I have a portfolio for a client that's there for multiple clients, it's a reduced risk or something like that. Um, and I'm watching the portfolio cause I'm watching the news and let's say I'm heavily invested. This actually happened at a firm I was at. We were heavily invested in oil, right? <laughs> and, uh, there was problems coming. I'm not going to go into the whole details, but there were problems coming down the pipeline where oil prices were going to tank, which means the value of the portfolio was going to go down. Right? So I, as the financial advisor went in, called my clients and said, Hey, I want to make these alterations to the portfolio. It's all internal within me. Right? They were all killed with it. I did it. When oil did go down, the other advisors in my office were all scrambling to call their clients and explain why they lost 10 or 12%. And they're asking me well, what happened. I'm like, I got them all out like three months ago when this first came down the pipe, because I thought we were overexposed just on the, the math. Now, do I recommend for an individual person to be speculating like that? No, not unless you really understand what's going on or you have a, a portfolio that you've designed and you understand how it's moving. But the thing to understand is this, <laughs> uh, the top 10% of the wealthiest Americans own 89% of the market. The rest of us that invest own the other 11%. And those 10%, because they own so much of it, believe you me, they watch the news. Their financial planners watch the news. <laughs> the analysts watch the news. And when they panic and do stuff, it affects all of your money. So you have to be sensitive to the fact. I'm not saying that you should be out there speculating or being crazy. You definitely shouldn't be, but this idea that <laughs> just don't watch the news, invest in the market, right? And it's like, you turn around and it's like, okay, I did that and I'm 62 and I'm about to retire. And 
boom, what happens? Oh, we've had the same year we've had this year where the market's in the toilet. Well, now if I retire, I'm retiring on a lot less. <laughs> if I start withdrawing money from that, I can't get it back. Why? Because I didn't strategize. I wasn't paying attention to the news. I wasn't getting consulting or getting help. Right? That happens. You know, if they'd have been paying attention to the news, you would have said, well, maybe I should go hire somebody to help me figure this out before I start doing something crazy. Right? But that's one of those things where I think it's just a weird thing. But what they're going to just sit there and go, well, look, see, all these people bailed out at this point, and then it came back. It's like, yeah, you don't want to do that. But at the same time, you got to also be thinking about what's the circumstance. And especially since they're talking about long-term investing, which I think is weird, since what we're really talking about since the beginning is millionaires who are in their 60s. So wouldn't, shouldn't we be talking about people who are withdrawing money? And I'm more interested in short term. I, I mean, this is where I'm so confused about, are we talking to a 20 year old? Are we talking to grandma? The premise is we're talking to a 20 year old, so. Yeah, which is weird. Because that's not who we've been talking about. <laughs> I guess we're talking to that one 20 year old who got the NFL scholarship or the NFL contract for 5 million a year. <laughs> So, let's just wrap this up real quick. Get distracted. We're our own worst enemy. So there's always been these behavioral studies. They show if you just if you invested in the S&P 500, you consistently earn somewhere between 9 to 11% on a long-term historical basis. Yet we Long-term historical basis, he means a century. If you're looking at the last 30 years, it's about 8%. When you look at the average investor, it's usually much less than half of that performance. And the reason is because we always go through the cycle of market emotions, meaning that we will think we're geniuses when markets are making money, but then when things get scary and the economy is going through its typical cycle of cleansing, we jump out because we're like, you know what, done with this, I'm not going to ride it out. I get out because I'm influenced by what's going on in the news. I mean, you know, if it bleeds, it leaves, yep. is what the news media, they don't make their money off of your financial success. They make their money by keeping your eyes and your ears peeled on the fear monk. Yeah, that doesn't really have much to do with that, but. Um, what he's talking about is what's called loss aversion in behavioral finance. Basically, it's money starts going down, you panic and you sell because you don't want to lose any more money as opposed to just realizing, look, once I sell, I've actually lost money. If I just hold on to this, you know, the investment and wait it out, it'll go back up. <laughs> right. That's what he's talking about. It's not a big, complicated thing to understand. I think it's just better to explain it to people than... Just no, just don't. Just put blinders on. <laughs> Buy an S and P five hundred fund. Don't act like you're rich. <laughs> just be rich. <laughs> However, that works. <laughs> yeah, that was all kind of odd advice. <laughs> right, which is why to a twenty year old. Which is why it's like you know we. I know we sit there to get criticized for like, oh, you guys are too mean and da 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 da. It's like, but they say such weird stuff, and it's kind of hard to not. It's kind of hard to not want to kind of look at what they're doing. It's like, I mean, <clears throat> I mean, we're not, not telling our twenty-year-old self to like not sign up for every credit card offer that gives you a free T-shirt on campus. I mean, like, I kind of feel like that's the kind of stuff my twenty-year-old self probably could have used, right? To hear. Well, and the difference. I mean, so this is kind of weird. Not. Well, the difference is, is we're not. We're not selling um, some financial package, right? Like just follow these nine, they have a nine step program. It's like 270 bucks and you buy it and they walk you through it. They've got all these other things they sell you. Um, you know, I think those are weird. I mean, I understand them doing their CFPs, they're doing a website to get more clients because you have to have an agreement with a client. You have a contract, the client can sue you. I mean, I'm sure that their firm does a great job for their clients, but you're just selling products to, to Joe Blow. But really what your, your whole thing is targeting is people with, with money, people with a half a million dollars to invest or more. I'm talking about people that, you know, just retired or people that just happen to have a half a million dollars 
in an account somewhere that they can just access whenever. It's not a lot of people that we're talking about. I mean, we can go back to the thing. It's less, we're talking about less than what, maybe five or six million people, 10 million people. Um, so it's kind of an odd thing. Plus, you know, the other thing is them kind of hugging on to Dave Ramsey and they're now kind of doing the same thing where it's, it's the lifestyle brand. Just we're trying to fit into this brand of you got to do this model and this sort of upper middle class kind of just live this way. Right. Have this attitude. It's like, as opposed to why don't you just give solid financial advice or solid criticism of bad financial advice, which is mostly what we do. Right. You know, we're not in any position where we're going to sit. Well, I mean, we could do that, but we're not, uh, I wouldn't feel it was ethical for us to give financial advice when we don't know who we're necessarily talking to. <laughs> I mean, I was, you know, if an individual called us on the phone, we might be a little bit more amicable, but it'd still be really couched because I wouldn't know all the details. Right. So I just think it's odd for CFPs to be this kind of, kind of weird cavalier and almost a little reckless with general advice and products they're selling. I just think it's odd. I mean, I don't think they're terrible or anything. I just, I also do think they are a little bit ridiculous. <laughs> so, 